This is Act 2, Scene 2 of William Shakespeare's tragedy, Romeo and Juliet, and this is a verse monologue by Juliet during the balcony scene. Tis but thy name that is my enemy. Thou art thyself, though not a Montague. What's Montague? It is nor hand, nor foot, nor arm, nor face, nor any other part belonging to a man. Oh, be some other name. What's in a name that which we call a rose? By any other word would smell as sweet. So Romeo would, were he not Romeo called, and retain that dear perfection which he owes. Without that title, Romeo doth thy name, and for thy name, which is no part of thee, take all myself. Okay, let's break down the analysis that I did for this verse speech. So the bulk of it is in iambic pentameter. Um, actually, all of it pretty much is with the exceptions of um, belonging to a man, OB, some other name. That one has 12 syllables in it. And the last line, which is a cue pickup for Romeo, is take all myself, so it doesn't follow the iambic pentameter. There are no feminine endings in this first speech. Um, to basically paraphrase what Julia is saying, she's saying, Romeo's not my enemy. Montague is just a name. Montague is my enemy. Romeo himself is not my enemy. And the fact that his name is Montague, Montague doesn't define him. She's trying to figure out, like, what what value does a name really have? Does it really define a person? And she discovers it doesn't, and that um, she compares it to roses. Um, roses would still smell as sweet if they were called any other word or any other title. And um, a lot of what Juliet is saying when she's making comparisons is a lot of antithesis. Um, for example, name, enemy, thyself, Montague, name, rose, word, sweet, are all of the antitheses that I found within this speech. Um, she billboards Romeo. And I think Juliet's argument is that Romeo's name is her enemy, not him. His name doesn't matter. She's saying a name will not stop her feelings for him. And so basically what she wants from the audience is their um, approval of this idea that a name really isn't what defines a person. So I guess her action is to convince the audience that a name is just a name. It's a title. It has nothing to do with the soul of a person or what their personality is. There are, are several repeated words within the speech. Uh, name, would, is, Montague other, Romeo, thy, nor, which, thy name. The big list that Juliet makes is nor hand, nor foot, nor arm, nor face, nor any other part. Um, the bulk of the speech is mostly monosyllabic, which means that it's a lot slower and that um, uh, it's not as rich, uh, I guess it's not as high language. There's a lot of alliteration with thyself though, it is, which we, word would, smell sweet, would were, that title. And several abutted consonants as well. But thy, art thyself, nor arm, without that title. So yeah. This is Act 3, Scene 2 of A Midsummer Night's Dream, a comedy by William Shakespeare, and this is Helena's verse speech to Hermia, trying to convince Hermia that she is not the bad guy. Um, this is during the lover's quarrel scene. <clears throat> Good Hermia, do not be so bitter with me. I evermore did love you, Hermia. 
did ever keep your counsels, never wronged you. Save that. In love unto Demetrius, I told him of your stealth unto this wood. He followed you for love. I followed him. But he hath chid me hence and threatened me to strike me, spurn me, nay, to kill me too. And now, so you will let me quiet go. To Athens will I bear my folly back and follow you no further. Let me go. You see how simple and how fond I am? Okay, let's talk about some of the analysis that I did for this speech. So essentially, um, what Helena is saying, to paraphrase, is that she's telling Hermia, don't be so bitter with me. I am your best friend. I am your sister, essentially. I've always given you good advice. I've always loved you. I've never hurt you or wronged you. But then she realizes, oh wait, I did make a mistake and I'm going to own up to it. I told Demetrius that you and Lysander ran off um, because of my love for Demetrius, right? So <clears throat> her argument is that she is not the bad guy here and that she is has always been loyal to Hermia and that she loves Hermia. Um, but she she realizes and she's owning up to the fact that she did make a mistake by telling Demetrius where Hermia and Lysander ran off to. Her action is to save face and um, her goal is to save her relationship with Hermia. Um, so the bulk of the verse lines do follow the iambic pentameter pattern for scansion with the exception of a couple. Uh, for example, good her, Mia, do not be so bitter with me. Did ever keep your counsels never wronged you. Uh, the verbs in the speech are did, love, keep, wronged, stealth, followed, chid, threatened, strike, spurn, kill, go, follow. So with the bulk of the verbs, I think that uh, Helena is using them uh, to it to an, as an advantage to her argument that, you know, I have also been hurt too. Demetrius has hurt me um, and that I'm not the bad guy. Uh, Demetrius is. Um, so it's mostly monosyllabic, which tells me that she is not rushing with her words and that uh, they need to be concise and clear. And also, I want to point out that she does billboard Hermia and Demetrius in this speech. Um, essentially, what she wants from the audience, too, is forgiveness and to see that she is not the bad guy and that Demetrius has more has done more damage than she has. Um, she's That's how she's earning points with the audience and with Hermia. Some, another big thing that I wanted to point out is that uh, there is the rule of three when she is talking about what Demetrius has done to her, to threaten, to strike, to spurn, to even kill her. Um, yeah, the repeated words are Hermia, me, love, unto, followed, he, go, no, so. So she's basically saying that love made her make this mistake and she's trying to own up to this mistake because she loves Hermia and doesn't want to ruin their friendship. This is Act 3, Scene 2 of Henry V, and this is the boy's prose monologue when he is talking about the three swashers. As young as I am, I have observed these three swashers. I am boy to them all three, but all they three, though they would serve me, could not be man to me. For indeed, Three such antics do not amount to a man. For Bardolph, 
he is white-livered and red-faced. By the means whereof he faces it out, but fights not. For pistol, he hath a killing tongue and a quiet sword. By the means whereof he breaks words and keeps whole weapons. For Nim, he hath heard that men of few words are the best men, and therefore he scorns to say his prayers, lest he be thought a coward. But his few bad words are matched with as few good deeds, for he never broke any man's head but his own, and that was against a post when he was drunk. I must leave them and seek some better service. Their villainy goes against my weak stomach, and therefore I must cast it up. Okay, let's look at the analysis for this prose speech for the boy in Henry V, uh, Act 3, Scene 2. So basically his argument is, is that Bardolph, Nim, and Pistol, um, their personality traits and their actions, you could add all of them up together and they still wouldn't equal a man. Um, the boy is saying that he is more man than they are. And because this is in prose, it is definitely more logically based. There's an introduction, uh, evidence, 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 and then a final conclusion. Um, these three swashers are his employers, and that's what he means when he says they would serve me. So basically what he does is go through each of these three swashers, Bardolph, Pistol, and Nim, and talk about how, using antithesis, how they portray themselves as men, but really aren't. Um, he's basically calling them all cowards and all fake, and they're villains to him, and he does not feel right uh, being employed by them. So they are not in any sort of service to him. So let's look at some of the antithesis that's being used. So when he first talks about Bardolph, he says he is white-livered and red-faced. So the, he's basically calling him a coward here. And then he goes on to say where he faces it out, but fights not. So he pretends like he's tough. He only acts like he's tough. He doesn't actually like physically fight um, to defend his toughness. And then he goes on for Pistol to say that Pistol has uh, a way with words and that he is good at destroying other people with his killing tongue, but he has a quiet sword, which means that he can cause a lot of destruction with words. But again, he doesn't follow those uh, words with action. Uh, his sword is not broken. <laughs> so then he goes on to talk about Nim. Um, so Nim states that he hath heard that men of few words are the best. And this is why he doesn't say his prayers at night. Um, however, um, his few bad words uh, <laughs> are matched with as few good deeds. For he never broke any man's head but his own, and that was against a post when he was drunk. And by the end of the speech, he's saying, I must leave them and seek some better service. Their villainy goes against my weak stomach, and therefore I must cast it up. So his argument is that these three swashers are not in any sort of service to him becoming a man. So this is why he goes to seek other employment. Um, and again, with prose, it's... It's more logically based. It, these are words that the boy has already come up with in his head and he knows what he's saying next. And so I think what he wants from the audience is to know that these traits are not the traits of men. So yeah.